I would like to thank the President for giving me the opportunity to speak in such a fascinating debate as this one. This is not a question which concerns fantasising about an ideal world without borders, but rather one where the practicalities and realities of such a move must be foregrounded. I will argue that borders are not only essential, but desirable. I expect at various points throughout the evening, borders will be portrayed as enabling aggression from large countries towards smaller ones and facilitating widespread unequal economic opportunities. The proposition would be right to raise such these issues. These are serious ones which plague our world today. What they are incorrect to do is to attribute them to the existence of borders and assert that if borders were abolished, these issues would be substantially diminished. This is wrong. It would massively exacerbate them. Borders are not the root causes of these very real problems. Rather, their presence actively serves to mitigate them. The proposition must prove that the abolition of borders would lead to a world that is a definitive improvement on the one we inhabit at present. It is an unenviable task. Now, it falls on me to introduce the speakers for the proposition. You have just heard from Tom Elliott, a first year reading classics at New. It is customary to poke fun at your opponents. However, given Tom stepped in and wrote his speech in 20 minutes, I just don't have the heart. S speaking next in proposition, we have Paul, Paul Donovan, the Global Chief Economist for UBS Wealth Management. He is a, also a member of the World Eight Economic Forum's Chief Economist Community and has authored books examining the environmental credit crunch and inflation inequality. It is perhaps unsurprising he is speaking in favour of abolishing borders, given much of wealth management involves finding rather creative ways to circumvent them. <laughs> Tonight's third speaker is Mike O'Sullivan, an author, economist and investor. His book, The Leveling, argues that the era of globalisation is now over and is being replaced by an increasingly values-driven order. He also ser previously served as Chief Investment Officer for International Wealth Management at Credit Suisse. Perhaps I discern a trend here. Closing off the proposition is Colin Yeo, an immigration and asylum barrister. In 2020, he authored Welcome to Britain, Fixing Our Broken Immigration System, in which he argues that the British immigration system is unforgiving, unfeeling, and ultimately failing. One does wonder how exactly fixing the system is synonymous with utterly eradicating it, which the ab abolition of borders would entail. I suppose the opposition will have to content itself with adopting this definition and fixing the proposition's argument for them. Mr. President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. I shall start by posing the question, what are our, what are our front doors but a border? We do not necessarily dislike those who we do not wish to enter our homes at any given moment. We may like them very much. But if you want a front door, then you want to form borders. We may invite others in. Indeed, it would be a sad existence if we did not do so. But only so long as our house rules are respected, we have the capacity to accommodate them and that they do not pose a danger to us. Households are a microcosm of wider society. We can and should take more refugees, for example. Borders should not be wholly closed, for a door is not a wall. It is made to both open and shut, but they must exist. Abolishing borders and abolishing front doors are ideas reliant on an interpretation of human nature that is naive to the point of complete fantasy. It may sound idyllic to abolish borders. I doubt the proposition would be as willing to remove their front doors. Borders are neither causes of global problems nor magic solutions. Rather, they play an important role in damage mitigation, particularly when this concerns protection of smaller countries. International boundaries give political territories recognition under international law and in the process invest states with sovereign equality. China and St. Kitts and Nevis are thus equals in the eyes of international law. Borders provide protection to vulnerable countries by enabling an international order which recognises boundaries. When these boundaries are crossed, appropriate action can be identified, implemented and most importantly, justified. Take the current situation in Ukraine. Yes, borders do not stop Russia invading Ukraine, but the fact that they exist means that the international impetus to first recognise a territorial violation and subsequently formulate a response including military aid was possible. In the event borders were abolished, the incentive for Russia to take control of Ukraine wouldn't just disappear. There'd just be no way to measure it. Far from decreasing the prospects of war, the lack of formal boundaries drawn around contested territory would likely inflame conflict and militant action by groups to control it. Except now there'll be no proper protocol based on borders to mitigate this. There is no specific likely outcome where removing borders would mean that the Russian state does not exist. It would simply have no border insulating it, facilitating expansion. Authoritarian governments would still desire expansion to control more capital and to impose their cultural homogeny on more people. 
In a world without borders, establishing such control simply gets easier because you no longer have internationally recognized standards of territorial sovereignty preventing rampant expansion. War would not be averted by abolishing borders, but intensified and with it this terrible impact on the world's most vulnerable. Examples of poorly drawn borders, such as those imposed by colonialists on the African subcontinent, may be raised in order to portray all of them as inherently devoid of meaning or value. The proposition says that because some borders are misplaced, we ought to remove them all. But if we have the power to remove them all, then surely we have the power to simply redraw them to better suit the current context. Fresh, stronger borders around Tibet, for example, would serve to distinguish a distinct territory with, a long, with long-standing cultural history from an aggressive neighbour which has forcibly annexed it. Let us now turn to the economic case. As such, the question of trade beckons. The worldwide free movement of goods, services, and indeed people may be raised as a potential benefit of, of abolishing borders. I profoundly disagree with the notion that abolishing borders is anything but conducive to economic carnage. I will make two points here before turning to the equally relevant topic of migration. Firstly, we already have international institutions like the WTO which try and protect liberal free trade. Why not strengthen these institutions and invest them with more power whilst retaining borders, thus maximizing the benefit derived from both structures? We can get most, if not all, of the benefits of free trade without the costs of removing borders. Free trade areas exist for this very purpose. The EU's policy of freedom of movement may be raised as a prototype for the motion, but each nation still retains borders and with that national sovereignty and the ability to, to defend itself in an individual capacity. Soft borders do not equate to no borders. Secondly, in the absence of national borders, it would become markedly easier for foreign corporations to take over domestic industry. Yes, one might argue that this takes place already, but without any truly localised insight stemming from people inhabiting the same area of land, you risk even more ecological destruction and underpaid labour. Trade protection is important, and one of the best ways to implement it is via a well-placed border. Take kick-starting manufacturing industries in underdeveloped countries where they can't initially compete with companies from large countries like China. Their products are probably not the most cost-efficient option on the market. Therefore, it is important they are protected from predatory competition by those seeking to make knockoffs. And imposing a physical border which these products have to pass through and thus be registered with is an excellent way of identifying. This applies to many culturally significant products. It's the reasoning behind protected designation of origin. Borders can be a useful tool to shield long-standing cultural traditions and practices from destruction by those purely motivated by profit. The opposition may attempt to portray the fact that borders exist as an impediment to immigration as bolstering their argument. It is worth challenging the presupposition that unlimited immigration, often touted as one of the main benefits of abolishing borders, is an inherent good in itself. This is not to propose a point based on xenophobia, rather it is the opposite. Take a developing country who decides to heavily invest in tertiary education. With stronger borders, brain drain is better prevented. This is an unequivocal good for everyone involved. The educated professionals contribute to the development and advancement of their native soil. The wider population benefits from their valuable services being exercised in their country and not abroad. The government receives positive reinforcement for beneficial investment decisions. Unless the proposition is seriously suggesting that it would be better for an intensification of the current situation, where healthcare staff are predominantly drawn from overseas at the expense of those left behind without the capital or resources to follow, they simply cannot suggest migration restrictions are an evil created by borders. Yes, one person may have what we might call the good fortune to be born in a particular country. The proposition may call it arbitrary, and so one human is no more entitled to inhabit a certain area than another. But arbitrary is not a synonym for unjust. Returning to the idea of societies as akin to houses, the fact that my childhood living room is mine and yours is yours is arbitrary. They nonetheless remain important things that ought to be respected, even if it came about as the result of neither of our decisions. Ground, for example, is sacred to many indigenous communities and it is key for indigenous people to retain their own borders. It is integral to their cultural preservation. A great number of indigenous languages are based on features of the land, so it is important their rights pertaining to their authority over said land are upheld and not trampled in some elite push for lofty ideals, ideals ignorant of the cultural significance of borders. For example, the difficulty Aboriginal Australians have had in securing land rights is directly related to the lack of acknowledgement of borders of their land and consequent claim to it. Borders define states, they endow them with sovereignty, they do not create, but rather reflect cultural, economic, and political differences. These differences are not artificial impositions, and thus borders are not simply artificial constructs. Rather than acting as an instrument of equity, 
Abolishing borders would have minimal effect on the very wealthy and large multinational corporations, but disastrous ones on the less fortunate who cannot insulate themselves from the consequences of such a policy. To abolish them would mean that we would be living under a single umbrella, but an umbrella where those with the most resources cluster in the middle and those with less get drenched. An umbrella full of the holes of rebellion, widespread corruption, economic catastrophe, cultural clashes, and marginalization. The exact type of conflict the abolition of borders was intended to minimize. I urge you to vote against this well-intentioned but fundamentally nonsensical motion.